Good morning, everyone. It's an honor for me to be here. Um, Parker gives me um, a, a great shout out by saying I am her mentor. She is mine as well, as are every one of the library leaders that are in this room. Um, they all know that actually I'm not a librarian and that I've been lucky and fortunate enough after spending many years working with local governments like Montgomery County um, to have moved into the world of public libraries. And in part that was because I had an aha moment when I understood that everything that a leader like Mr. Leggett was up worrying about at night, that everything that Mayor Bowser was thinking about, that everything that any other elected or top appointed official in this country was worried about and the challenges that they were facing were in part or wholly being addressed by our public libraries. As I was getting ready for this morning, I was recalling a fall morning just about a year ago when I was going to another library, actually in another part of the country. But it could have easily been in Montgomery County. I was running a little late. I didn't have time for public transportation that I was not terribly familiar with. And so I grabbed a cab. And as soon as I popped into that cab and sat down and gave the address of where I was going, the cab driver looked at me and said, Madam, the library is not yet open. <laughs> he knew everything about that library that I was going to. I asked him how he knew. He was a recent arrival to this country. He came from the African continent. And he told me a story for the next 15 minutes that filled me up. He told me about when he came with his wife and his two children, one of the first directives that he was given was to go to the public library because he would be welcome there and that people could help him get settled. Did they? He described to me how every day after school, his wife goes to the school and picks up his two little boys, an eight and a 10 year old, and takes them to the public library for homework help. Because they're worried, he and his wife, that their English is not so good yet. And he wants to make sure that those two little boys are successful. And just about that time, we pulled up to a stoplight and he had the time to look back and give me a beautiful big smile and tell me that his little boys were straight A students. And that when, while his boys were at homework help, his wife was on the computer, one because there's significant unrest back in his home country. And while his family in that country doesn't have a computer, they sometimes find a way to get to a computer with internet access and they're able to exchange information and find out about one another's safety. In addition, this man was an educated man. And he said, I can actually do much more for this country than just drive cabs. And while my wife and I can't yet afford a computer, nor can we afford internet access, while the boys are learning, she is also looking for a way in for another job for me that will help my family move along. Oh, we also go to the library for English as a second language class. And soon we will start our classes to become citizens of the United States. Wow, that's a great story. It's a story about the library being an anchor for a family for their education, for their prosperity in growing their family and their ability to participate in the economy. And it's a story about becoming an American. It's everything that we believe in in the United States, and it's wrapped up in the public library. At the end of the 19th century, in the beginning of the 20th century, 
Andrew Carnegie, an immigrant himself who came to the United States without being able to read, understood the opportunities that he had had when people in his community helped him learn how to read and lent him books. He was determined that he was going to give back to the country and spent hundreds of millions of dollars building public libraries in our country. The story that that cab driver told me was everything that Andrew Carnegie envisioned. Following in Mr. Carnegie's footsteps are Bill and Melinda Gates, who at the end of the 20th century and the beginning of the 21st century have invested over $1 billion in public libraries in the United States. Understanding that libraries, just as Mr. Leggett described, needed to change, and that the key resource that we had had in our libraries, books filled with information, were still very important, but that there was a new resource that could provide information, and it was the technology of computers and connectivity to the internet. And it's through the Gates Foundation that many of our libraries were able to get started in bringing technology to the forefront for citizens to use, just again, like that cab driver who could not afford a computer in his family's home. Today, you are doing the same thing that Mr. Carnegie did, that Bill and Melinda Gates have done, and that you started actually six years ago when you held your first summit. You are resettling in again, coming together again to talk about what is needed for this community. Mr. Leggett said, said it right when he said the library's got to change. And it's because you are changing. It's because your neighbor is changing. It is because the county is changing. And we all need different things in our life as we grow and as we change. Too many people get stuck on where we've been. I can't tell you the people who the people I run into who continue to think about libraries as being these quiet repository of books. I'm here to tell you the books are our brand, but they're not our business. Our business is what's inside of those books. Our business is being able to get information via the internet. It's knowledge that's our business. And it's the ability to share and provide knowledge and equal access to everyone, no matter what their age, no matter what stage they are in their life. Whether it's the toddler who's coming in and getting their very first library card, whether it's the PhD student who comes and uses a quiet corral because things are too noisy in their home, whether it is the adult who somehow didn't quite make it out of high school, but understands it's important to get that GED or their high school diploma now, the library is there to help along that stage. Education has changed, and it is changing right now as we are here today. What we understood is education when I was a child in elementary school is vastly different than what we understand education today. We have a need to make sure that we understand the assets that the public library brings to all of us for education. The complements, and it's different than what is provided in the public schools, but has a unique ability to help every one of us in our journey, in our continuous education throughout our lives. The public library is that one institution that from the moment you're born 
maybe even from the time you're, you're in your mama's tummy and she's coming to the library to learn about prenatal care or baby development. From the time you are born to really the end of your life, you are always learning. And the public library is that one learning institution that's with us forever. But education today is so different than that passive way of gaining information in the past. Coming in, perhaps being in the classroom, having a strict curriculum, going to the library quietly, perhaps exploring, researching ideas. Today what I see in public libraries around education is all action, all the time. And it, again, so complements what is happening in our schools. Because it not only allows us to use the content from schools, but it also focuses on 21st century lead, uh, learning skills. The ability to critically think, to, to determine what's the information that I need, and with the aid of the library staff, go in search of it. It's the creativity of conversations that occur in libraries where you're exploring ideas or topics with others who have the same passion. It is problem solving. It is learning to think independently and using initiative. The kinds of active learning that I see are amazing to me. And I want to describe some of those today to you. One of the first times that I had an, uh, a new recognition of what was happening in libraries was a conversation in Ann Arbor, Michigan, when the public library director, Josie Parker, was talking about the brigade of sewing machines that were coming into her library on a regular basis. Every week, a group of both mature adults and teenagers were bringing their, pub, their, their sewing machines to a community room because they all had a passion for fashion. And they came together and they designed and they sewed. And then they sold. Active learning. In another part of the country, Allen County, Indiana, where Fort Wayne is located, I had the opportunity to visit my very, very first, what is called a maker space. It's where people come together and decide that they're going to tinker or use new technology or more traditional tools and work together on projects. While the library at that time didn't have space, they found a double wide trailer that they parked in the parking lot and when I entered into this double wide trailer, it was lined with computers, with 3D printers, with laser cutters, and with lathes, and with saws. And there was all ages there, from 15 years old to 75 years old. And they were working on projects together. That was the very first time I saw a 3D printer in action. I'm a person who likes bracelets. And someone noticed that in that trailer. And by the time I left the library that afternoon, they had created a new bracelet for me on a 3D printer. And it gave me a quick realization on the ability to program with a computer and build something to cut that could have maybe fun value, but something perhaps yet even more important. Thinking more important, going over a couple states, in Johnson County Public Library, Johnson County, Kansas, a teenager two years ago went to their makerspace, their lab, and using the public computer at the library, and sophisticated computer-aided design software, downloaded a design for a hand prosthetic. Now it turns out that this teenage boy had befriended a little kid who was in middle school. 
And that little kid had been born without fingers on his right hand. And he thought that he might be able to create a prosthetic with movable fingers for this little kid that would be scaled just right. And that's what he did. He downloaded the software, he scaled it, sized it for the boy, and then printed a prosthetic which that middle schooler wears today. Yet going further west, in San Diego, California, earlier this month, they opened another kind of active learning space. San Diego has determined that they really want to build their biotech economy. <coughs> they've got the Salk Institute, they've got Scripps not far away, and they've got some existing strong biotech firms. A smart librarian got in touch with one of those firms and said, we've got some space that's not being used. Do you have any equipment that's not being used? And within a pretty short period of time, they didn't have necessarily a laser cutter, but they had microscopes, they had a DNA copying machine, they had all sorts of centrifuges, and soon they created the very first bio lab in a public library, which just recently opened. It's complemented by individuals who come in from corporations, from universities, to give presentations on science and medical related topics. They create programs where they're coming together and tinkering and learning how to use this new equipment. And they're anticipating that this will be one of the footholds for people, for kids who want to think about a career in the sciences will be able to get their start. Which reminds me of a wonderful conversation I recently had with a person at the, in the West Wing of the White House who just got his degree in engineering. He got his start. He's around 30 years old. He got his start in a neighborhood library in the city of Detroit. Single mama dropping off her boys with the grandmother every morning. This young man's brothers were everything about athletics. He would describe himself as not having a coordinated muscle in his body. And his grandmother got that, and she took him to the library. Luckily, there was a librarian there who kind of got him and steered him towards some books about building and some Legos. And all of a sudden, he saw his future. And as he finishes up his PhD, he works at the White House with our chief technology officer for the country. All of these are stories about active learning that's happening in our public libraries. And all of them reflect the active learning, in fact, that's happening in your public libraries here in Montgomery County. Little, Little Rock, Arkansas, another community that was trying to figure out where they were gonna go with their economy, decided their future would be around sustainability and everything green. As they were doing their citywide strategic plan and coming on to that decision to be a green economy and to attract businesses that were interested in sustainability, they had an opportunity to build a new central library. They made the decision that that library would not only be the first lead building in Arkansas, but that everything they did in building that library could be, could be hands-on with the community. That the community would be able to see what was being done that made it a sustainable building, and that they would be able to contribute as much as possible with their own local materials and machines. That building today continues to be a model for creating new efficiencies and new technologies around sustainability. 
They have a very close relationship with the University of Arkansas and their engineering department and with key entrepreneurs in the sustainability area in Little Rock. Not only that, but the local leaders there decided that not only would it be a sustainable library, but that this would be a library that would be essential to the community. And so when they redid their citywide organizational chart, the core of that city, the first essential service is identified as the public library. Because if you're gonna be a 21st century city and a 21st century economy is the knowledge economy, you want your public knowledge institution, your public library, to be at the core. And after that comes police and fire and garbage pickup. But first off is the public library. Omaha, Nebraska, next month is going to be cutting a ribbon on a space they call their do space. You come to this space and you do. They've just bought a Borders bookstore that closed, and they've re-kitted it with every piece of technology they could think of. Again, because they know that while there's great wealth in the city of Omaha, there is also a real need for many people in the community who have no access to technology to be able to come in and have easy access to technology, not only what we have available today, but what they know will be needed in the future. And so they're already budgeting for being able to do constant updates and bringing in new technology. And maybe my last example for technology and active learning is with the city of Chicago and the Chicago Public Library, where five years ago, they opened up a new teen space called U Media, Y-O-U Media and it's all about the you as a kid. It was space that was kind of cordoned off from the other parts of the library. It was made to be used heavy by the kids, and they put every piece of technology in there that they could think of. And the kids came, and they kept coming, and they kept coming, and they kept coming. And what they found, in addition to having that important technology there, was the staff. The staff that had been trained to specifically work with kids as coaches and mentors. Not in a traditional librarian way, but as a traditional facilitator and coach. The kids who come to that particular library tend to be primarily minority kids. And they're teenagers, a time when many, many kids stop going to the public library. And they tend to be more boys than girls. And they tend to be boys who self-identify themselves as having been, at the best, C students, more likely D and F students. Kids who had lost their confidence in the classroom. Kids who did not fit into the traditional academic patterns that occur in schools. Today, those kids have gained skills that they have never been able to, to gain in any other place. They now see a future for themselves in occupations that they could never have imagined themselves, and they have brought the confidence that they gained in the U Media space back into their classrooms and are doing better as students as well. Active learning, doing, is at the hallmark of what public libraries do so very well. All of these sp spaces certainly are called the public library. Sometimes we hear the term technology lab, an innovation lab. And in Wichita, Kansas, they call this space a space to collide, collaborate, and create. All of this good education is important because enable us to continue to be a strong county, a strong nation, we've got to have an educated workforce. 
And so the public library plays a very important role in that today. In addition to that, we know that our public libraries, just by virtue of their physical presence in a community, add economic value. Mayor Daley in Chicago knew that well. And over the course of his tenure as mayor, either rebuilt or built a new library in every one of the neighborhoods that needed a library. There are close to 90 public libraries in the city of Chicago. And in many of those neighborhoods, there were no social assets. The only thing that existed in those neighborhoods were liquor stores, check cashing stores, and the, li the library became a space and has become a space in all of those areas where there is a new social asset around which new small businesses are developing. Small cafes, card shops, stationery stores. And so the library in its presence has a positive effect. And it has a positive effect we know for homeowners as well. Libraries serve as a community anchor. And while we have so much technology in our lives, we still need one another. We are social beings. And so our public libraries offer a time and a place for us to come together as citizens. And I think we can't discount that too much. The Knight Foundation, several years ago, issued a report called Soul of the Community. And what that report, in essence, says is that when we have their strongest communities, when there is a sense of ownership in the community, when the economy is strong, it's when we can come together as people, as residents and citizens, and be together. We need one another. I can't tell you the times that I have had conversations with individuals when they find out what I do professionally when they have not told me some very profound story of their life and the role the library played. I bet there are several of you in this room who had something quite transformational happen in a public library. I recently told one individual I work with libraries and she said, oh, I always feel such peace and safety when I enter my public library. Can you imagine that being said by about any other public space? I always feel such peace and safety. There is something soulful about public libraries. And while all of this change is happening outside the library, and all of this change is happening inside the library with the addition of technology, with active learning and more noise. There is still the essence of this safety and security that we can hold dear and should never ever be lost. So what's different in libraries? I've described something that's happening on the education side, how we have a real focus on on helping our economy and how we can work with small businesses. Our spaces are different. You see that in your own libraries. The, the people who work in our libraries come with different backgrounds, certainly still masters with a library emphasis, but we have more and more people in our libraries who are educators, who have specialty areas. It could be in communications, in marketing, because those are the kinds of uh, knowledge and information that we need. The resources that we have continue to evolve, and they will. Our spaces are less books and more flexible space that can be used in all sorts of ways that we may know today, but we can't even begin to imagine for tomorrow. I want to tell you what a wonderful event this is today that brings you all here to think together and to dream together. I'd say my charge to you is to recognize the wonderful assets that you already have in the Montgomery County Public Library and the staff. 
and to build on what there is going forward based on what you know your needs are, your family needs are, your neighborhood and community needs are, and your county needs are. You've got great leadership in this county. You're very fortunate, we're very fortunate. And so how do we take what we have today and we embroider on that and make it yet even bigger and better for us tomorrow? So thank you very much. Thank you.